Hello and welcome to Mechanical Ventilation Complications. This is the third part in our series on mechanical ventilation for nurses. Today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the complications that result from our mechanical ventilation and how to find those. So first of all, one of the first things that we would use to find a complication is our ventilator alarms. So the ventilator is set up with our patient and it knows a few things. It knows about pressure, it knows about volume, it knows about rate. It doesn't know how your patient's doing. So we always need to look at the patient when we're assessing the ventilator alarms. The first of which is the high pressure limit alarm. This can occur if there's some kind of a blockage to the ventilator. So if it's going against too much pressure for some reason, maybe the tubing's kinked or there's a blockage in the endotracheal tube or whatever the case may be. But for some reason, there is some kind of blockage that is causing too much pressure for the ventilator to have to push against. Always assess and treat the patient before silencing the alarm. Now, if you work in an area that has lots of ventilators, oftentimes the high pressure limit alarm goes off because a patient coughs or repositions, and we kind of get in the habit of just hitting the silence button. But always be looking at that patient before you hit the silence button, just to be sure that everything's okay. Low pressure limit alarm and low exhale tidal volume, these two are kind of combined together because often they will go off at the same time. And if you think about it, low pressure limit, okay, it's expecting to feel some pressure, some resistance from the patient. And if there's no pressure, no resistance, and there's no exhaled volume, that might indicate that the tubing is dislodged. There could also be a tubing leak. Maybe the tubing itself isn't connected very well or has a cut in it. There could be a leak in the endotracheal tube or a leak around the endotracheal tube. So check the tubing. This is all about tubing here with a low pressure limit alarm and low exhale tidal volume. High respiratory rate alarm. Take a look and see if the patient is in distress. That's number one because a high respiratory rate could indicate that your patient has maybe had some kind of acute event occur, maybe such as a pulmonary embolism or a change in their condition. So we always want to be looking at the patient first, but it can also be because of a blockage. Often the high respiratory rate will go off because we have some water in the tubing or because there's a partial blockage in the endotracheal tube. Maybe there's some secretions that are caught there and that's causing a bubbling kind of effect. Blockages might be the cause as well. So assess and treat your patient. The apnea alarm typically is going to go off because of disconnected tubing or a change in your patient's condition. So maybe your patient actually is apneic, a changing condition. But in many cases, it's going to be because the tubing became disconnected and now the ventilator is no longer receiving any kind of respiratory effort from the patient and it's saying, hey, uh, there's a problem here. It could be that the patient's apneic, or it could be that the tubing is disconnected. So again, look at the patient first, and then go back and look at the tubing. Keep in mind that with any of these alarms, if they keep alarming, you can't figure out what's wrong, disconnect the patient from the ventilator, grab your Ambu bag, and bag the patient. So one of the complications that we commonly associate with endotracheal tubes and mechanical ventilation is a hospital-acquired pneumonia, or otherwise known as a ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP. So to find it, we're going to be looking for an increase in the patient's white count, radiographic evidence. On the symptom-wise, we could be seeing tachypnea, fever, of course, cough and sputum might also be present. Factors that increase the risk include decreased salivary flow. Our patients who are on mechanical ventilation may be given medications during surgery to decrease their salivary flow. Salivary flow is stimulated by eating. So if the patient's not eating, they're gonna have decreased salivary flow. Salivary flow washes out that bacteria that gets in the mouth, down the esophagus, into the stomach, stomach acid kills it. So 
if we don't have that salivary flow, then that bacteria can sit there in the mouth and it can just kind of slowly move down and maybe slip past that endotracheal tube into the lungs. Systemic antibiotics also increase the risk. Pooling of our subglottic secretions, again, these are the secretions I'm talking about here, coming from the nose, coming from the mouth, and they're just pooling on top of that endotracheal tube balloon. Remember the, the anatomy here, and we're blowing up this balloon in the trachea to try to seal off that endotracheal tube. At the same time, we can be compressing that esophagus a little bit to the point where these secretions are going down and following the endotracheal tube into the lung rather than going down into the stomach. Normalization of our stomach acid has also been shown to increase the risk, so giving that patient the protonics, etc., is, is also a risk for increasing hospital-acquired ventilator-associated pneumonia and keeping our patients NPO. There may be some translocation of gut bacteria that occurs, and that translocation into the bloodstream can cause the patient to develop pneumonia, interestingly. Prevention would be good pulmonary hygiene, okay? So we want to have uh, that turning, positioning, coughing, deep breathing, all of those kind of things we'd want to have with our patient. Keeping the head of the bed up 30 to 45 degrees, it would help to encourage those subglottic secretions to move down the esophagus instead of going down the larynx into the trachea and potentially into the lungs. Oral care. And get, get rid of that bacteria that's in the mouth so that it's not sitting there. You know, you have a patient who's, in, who's intubated and, and we haven't done any mouth care for 8, 10 hours, 12 hours. You go in there and you look at their mouth, it's going to be really gross, okay? So there's bacteria in there. We need to get rid of it. And that's going to also help to decrease the chance of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Decreasing our sedation and lightening it up. Uh, at periods of time or lightening it up entirely so that the patient is not as deeply sedated and is able to better manage their secretions, etc. Those things help. GI prophylaxis and VTE prophylaxis are helpful also. Atelectasis is another type of a complication that can occur with mechanical ventilation. The normal process of breathing is diaphragm drops, chest wall expands, we have a negative pressure, a vacuum, and that vacuum is pulling the alveoli open from the outside of the alveoli. It's like grabbing a balloon on the outside and pulling it open. That's what's happening normally. When we put somebody on mechanical ventilation, now we're pushing air in. We're pushing it in from the level of the trachea down into the lungs. So the big airways are going to get most of the air and way down there distally in the bottoms of the lungs and way out distally at the alveoli, we don't get as much airflow. So because of this, some of the alveoli can start to collapse, especially if the patient also has some underlying pathology going on. Now notice here, this uh, patient here has got atelectasis uh, almost entirely of that right lung that will be on the left side of the screen. And almost entirely that left lung is just completely atelectic. So we're only using one lung. <laughs> That's not a very good option. To detect it, we're going to be listening for decreased breath sounds, reduced lung compliance, refractory hypoxemia. Those would be awesome signs. And preventing aggressive pulmonary hygiene. Again, turning, positioning, coughing, deep breathing, all of those good pulmonary hygiene activities. Another complication is barotrauma, and barotrauma occurs when we have too much pressure in the lungs and that's causing damage to the lung tissue itself. So first of all, we might see some restlessness, some diminished breath sounds unilaterally if the patient has developed a pneumothorax, dyspnea, hypoxemia. To prevent it, we want to try to maintain moderate levels of PEEP and pressure support so we're not getting into those high pressure situations using lower tidal volumes, and in most cases now, we're using lower tidal volumes with our patients. In the past, it had been recommended that we start our mechanical ventilation at 10 ml per kilogram, and now we're moving to lower tidal volumes in the 5 to 6 ml per kilogram range, so that we're not having as much volume 
in the lung. It's think about it like blowing up a balloon. If you don't put as much volume into the balloon, it's less likely that it's going to pop. You blow too much volume into the balloon, it's more likely it's going to pop. We also want to avoid those hyperventilation situations that can occur where the patient may have breath stacking. Remember, we used to do that with CPR, try to get breath stacking. We don't want our patient to get breath stacking here. This is especially important when your patient is on assist control because if they keep stimulating that ventilator very quickly, the breaths just keep coming and there's not enough time to exhale before the next breath. Be extra careful with your COPD patients. Oxygen toxicity, I mentioned this earlier, this is when we have those free radicals form as a result of giving our patient oxygen when the patient is in a situation where they have inflammation occurring. So when there's inflammation and we give additional oxygen, the body will take that additional oxygen and the inflammatory process will turn it into these things called oxygen free radicals. Their normal function is to kill bacteria, but in a situation where our inflammation is out of control, those free radicals will kill regular healthy tissue. We're going to detect this by seeing decreased gas diffusion in our patients and the need for a higher FiO2. Uh, we can try to prevent that by having good pulmonary hygiene. Another complication is the failure to wean. We put people on mechanical ventilation anticipating that we're going to get them off. So we detect that by having an increase in the respiratory rate, increase in their blood pressure and heart rate, falling PO2 and O2 sat when we're trying to wean the patient. To prevent a failure to wean, we want to begin mechanical ventilation with weaning in mind. In other words, use the least amount of ventilation that we need to in order to get the patient over that acute event and start weaning immediately as soon as that patient is hemodynamically stable. So monitor for hemodynamic changes. Remember that when we change mechanical ventilation, we're changing pressures in the thorax, and those pressures in the thorax then could be causing changes in hemodynamics. Maintain their nutrition. There has been a correlation between albumin levels and the failure to wean, so we want to maintain nutrition and be aware of the long-term effects of sedation. Good pulmonary hygiene, I've mentioned this over and over again in this video, is deep breathing, incentive spirometry, coughing, forced expiration, okay, the patient takes a breath in and then forces it out really hard to try to mobilize some of those secretions. Turning and positioning, ambulation, hydration, and then bronchodilators. So these are the things that we can do to try to prevent these respiratory complications. Key points. Always assess the patient first. That ventilator alarm is loud. It's going to get your attention. The lights are blinking on the ventilator. These things are going to grab your attention. Move your attention from the loud back to the patient and assess the patient first. Keep emergency equipment in hand, especially an ambu bag. Keep the patient comfortable so the patient's not continuously bucking the ventilator. And remember that mechanical ventilation is not going to cure your patient. It's supporting them, getting them over the hump, so we can take it off and the patient can get back to spontaneous breathing. Thank you for joining me for Mechanical Ventilation Complications. Until next time, 